Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan, MSP. This is U Ukraine War news update, second part thereof for the 22nd of March 2024. It's been a very difficult day for the Ukrainians already. I've had a, a breaking news piece and then a very long live stream discussing with Greg, who was in Kharkiv, the, uh, the ramifications of and the strikes in general uh, that took place um, yeah, overnight. Lots of missiles hammering into Ukraine and drones from Russia. Um, we'll get more details of that as the day goes on. In terms of military equipment and military aid, I'm going to start with the EU. The This is concerning the potential for the EU to skim off the f profits of frozen Russian assets within the EU and use those profits to buy up uh, military equipment for the Ukrainians. And then with that, the proposal was 90% to spend on directly on military equipment for Ukraine and 10% to invest in Ukrainian, the Ukrainian military defense industrial complex. Okay, Vienna is against the idea of transferring profits on a frozen Russian assets to weapons for Ukraine, Chancellor of Austria said before the summit of European leaders. Uh, this is... I guess to be expected they're a neutral country and so from their point of view what they want to what they're trying to say is that neutral countries shouldn't have what's effectively part of their investment part of their money spent on military aid so it could be quite difficult for the for the EU to get that done I don't know whether they could do some kind of proportionality there where they take 127th or whatever it may may end up being of the funding of those of, of the frozen asset profits funding and use that for humanitarian aid or reconstruction and the rest of it spent on on military aid i don't know uh, the eu though apparently has moved closer today to finalizing a proposed plan to use profits from frozen russian state assets to purchase weapons for ukraine so fingers crossed something good will come out of that uh, uh, today essentially uh, France, Germany and other EU countries are n reportedly opposed to a proposed plan of issuing bonds from profits stemming from fro frozen as uh, Russian assets, according to Reuters, citing unnamed political uh, diplomatic sources. Sorry, The US is uh, supposedly keen on issuing bonds. Bonds are like little loans, from, as far as I understand bonds, little sort of loans, if you like, debt. So you have a, a bunch of debt and you can... Uh, issue that debt out to people and then it matures and you pay them back I presume with interest and that's a way of you know, getting people to pay for your your debt but you issue them to government other governments and corporate entities rather than you know individual humans uh, and yeah that is something that the US are looking into and could be they could be quite keen on that given the issues with the funding impasse from in congress eu is looking into this but looks like there could be some big opponents to that not quite sure whether that's they they want something just a case of giving aid to ukraine rather than kind of loaning it in in the form of bonds and using that money to generate aid i don't know maybe maybe it's not a bad thing that they're, they're saying they don't want to do that there could be better ideas or there there's some particular reason why the french and germans are not keen on that um, French aid to Ukraine uh, reporting here Thierry Breton from the EU, uh, although he is French, this is on behalf of the EU. We had a production capacity of 500,000 shells a year and in 10 months we've doubled it and we will increase it to more than 2 million by 2025. We're in the process of going into war economy mode, especially in terms of gunpowder and explosives. This is very good. This is important rhetoric from Thierry Breton and it also shows that the EU is cognizant of the challenges Ukraine is facing and the possible you know instability with regard to American aid so the EU is stepping up and saying right we need to make sure that there is a sustainable um, production within the EU in terms of artillery ammunition not just for Ukraine but for European safety I would have thought as well security Poland's foreign minister Radislav Sikorski married to Anne Applebaum is it says if the US fails to deliver military support in you to Ukraine, despite the commander in chief's desire to do so, that's Biden, allies will start developing their own nuclear weapons because America is dysfunctional and unreliable. There is genuinely so this is this is an interesting discussion here. I was listening to Ukraine the latest yesterday and um 
Hamish Bretton Gordon was talking about how actually nuclear proliferation is a, a, a topic that many people are worried about as a kind of law of unintended consequences of not giving aid to Ukraine and then US not seen as being this dependable resource and this dependable um, ally will then mean that people are going to be looking to prov- to, to build their own nuclear capabilities in order to, to be dependent, independent, sorry, in terms of their own defence. That could be a worry going forward. There are people apparently who are genuinely worried about uh, about this. Uh, with US funding for Ukraine stalled in Congress, the US proposes using profits from frozen Russian assets to issue at least $50 billion in bonds to aid Ukraine. That's what I was just talking about, and that's being reported in Bloomberg. Uh, you and my then press talking about that as well. Dynamics of US military aid to Ukraine. Here's an infographic. The money previously committed for Ukraine ran out in November 2023. And the US Congress has been delaying another $61 billion worth of aid. It says here for four months. I'd say that's pretty much six months. Uh, we have uh, what it says here. I mean, I don't know exactly when this infographic was created. Well, it's, it's got to be sometime in March or so fairly, fairly recent. Um, so for four months, the U.S. has been blocking a $61.4 billion uh, of aid to Ukraine. The last U.S. military aid package of $42.2 billion ran out in November 2023. Congress still blocks new aid of $61.4 billion. And because of this, the U.S. began transferring weapons directly from the Pentagon stockpiles, thus reducing the U.S. stockpile. The next aid package is expected to be only $126 million and will be the fourth transfer outside of the main packages. So these, what's in, in black there, are elements of aid packages that fall outside of the funding released through Congress. So there was one initially right right way back, 400 million way back in February. And then there's we, there's a one from December and the one that's just passed of 300 million. And there could be a further one coming soon. But essentially, you know, it's, it's dwindled down to what, two months of nothing, literally zero. I mean, quite incredible, really quite incredible. Um, Okay, moving on. Another three House members in the US House of Representatives have signed a discharge petition. The total is now 188 out of 218. It's slowly progressing. I don't know that it's got any hope, really, unless you get Republicans walking across the aisle. And you should have that. This is not a partisan deal, even though it's become a partisan deal. But in principle, it's not a partisan deal at all. Uh, Subject, I, I just... I I say I don't get it, but I do get it for all the reasons I I bang on about the whole time. Um, Among the new signees is Ken Buck. So Ken Buck is this Republican hardliner who is, uh, I think, quite principled. I mean, I don't agree with his politics, but I really agree with what he's been saying recently in terms of the absolute chaos in, in Congress, the chaos in how things are getting done, particularly on the Republican side. He's been absolutely uh, excoriating of what's been taking place and he's he's I mean he's on his way out I think he's due to be out the House of Representatives is it next week uh, but his signature will stay on it as, as far as I understand it so he's signed that and it won't disappear with his um, resignation uh, with, with his actual final day of, of work um, but yeah so, it's, so that's really good that there is at least one Republican on there let's try and get some more please you know it just needs uh, what, what do you need? Thirty Republicans would be would be nice. No, twenty Republicans. No, I can't do my maths. Thirty Republicans <laughs> um, w- would be very very good. Thank you. I've talked about Senator Joe Manchin as a Democrat. I don't particularly like, and I have to make a correction. I said he came from an oil rich state, and I just misspoke. It's of course it's a coal it's a big coal mining state um, that he's Virginia that he's uh, in uh, one of the senators. Uh, that's where that's where he's he's set up shop. We can't let Ukraine not set up shop. That's where he's from. I can't get my words out. Uh, quote: We can't let Ukraine get through this if it comes through the spring and we haven't helped Ukraine. God help us. That'll be the worst atrocity in history that your children or grandchildren will be reading about that we've done. And I, although I reported on him he's saying that yesterday, it's just a fuller quote uh, for, from what he has said, which I completely agree with. You know. Um, I think it it is that important at the moment. Right, 
over to the Netherlands again, just coming up with the goods. In 2024, the Netherlands will allocate another 2 billion euros in funding for military support to Ukraine, according to Prime Minister Mark Rutte, so he said at the end of the Kiev Security Forum. It's interesting, Mark Rutte, as a sidebar, before we go on to the rest of that, as a sidebar, there's a lot of talk about who should be the next Secretary General of the of the of NATO. Uh, previously, we've had Jens Stoltenberg, I think, for ten years now. Uh, he's due to be replaced, and there's been a, a lot of talk about who it should be. Mark Rutte is a favoured person at the moment. I think the understanding is that he'll be strong in standing up to Trump. So he's had form for standing up to Trump before. This is gen- it's not me saying this or trying to be political. This is genuinely what it, are the rumours that have come out out of NATO and out of uh, these political spheres is that there were there were two women, uh, Fredrickson from Denmark and Kaya, um, Kaya Kallas from Estonia. And they were not favoured predominantly because they were female and it was thought that Trump would not uh, interact particularly well with them. Uh, but Mark Rutt has stood up for Trump pr- publicly before and has been respected by Trump for doing that. And so that's why he's a favourite choice. However, there are other people. There's a recent article, I think, in The Telegraph by someone from, it might be a French person, French military person saying he's he should not be a good choice because actually he's got form when in being in charge so he's a previous um dutch um premier where he's been for some time now he's 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 done a pretty good job of keeping them all together with the with the various coalitions that have uh, consistently had to be made there however he has not succeeded in getting the dutch to um spend 2% of their gdp on defense which is one of the nato criteria so why would he be rewarded with secretary generalship of nato if he, he can't if he hasn't achieved one of the basic principles and then uh, the same person in the article was looking at Kaya Kallas and saying uh, which i've told you before there's this worry with her that she's too anti russia so her rhetoric against putin has been so strong that she would be deemed as counterproductive. And the person who wrote the article, as I said, I think it's a French general, saying that another one that should be thrown into the mix, well, first of all, the idea is it probably should come from Eastern Europe, someone to be in charge of NATO because of the importance of that part of the world. And, you know, it's it's kind of the centre of gravity, isn't it, for this whole conflict uh, that we're experiencing. But... The, yeah, he, he was suggesting that Johannes, the um, the Romanian premier, is a good candidate because A, he's successfully got them over 2% of GDP spent on defence. B, they've done a lot to support NATO. They're just, they're just given the green light to a massive NATO base in Romania. They're training F-16 pilots. Romania are genuinely a uh, an important component of NATO given their geographic location in the east of Europe and close to say Ukraine the Black Sea and R- Russia so having their premier as as a leader as a secretary general general of NATO could be a really strong um signal and a, and a very good nomination uh, so we'll have to see but anyway going back to the Dutch according to Rutter this funding of 2 billion uh, euros, 250 million of which will go to the Czech initiative to purchase artillery shells. Quote, and this is not our last contribution. We are also working hard to ensure that 24 Dutch F-16 aircraft are in the skies over Ukraine as soon as possible. And I mentioned that yesterday, so that's really good. Estonia has announced another package of military aid to Ukraine valued at 20 million euros. The package includes recoilless anti-tank guns, explosives, various types of artillery ammunition, gas masks, sniper equipment, smaller caliber ammunition and more. Uh, so that's really good news from Estonia. Lithuanian Ministry of Defence, so another Baltic nation, has handed over anti-drone systems to Ukraine, according to the Lithuanian Defence Ministry's website. When I tell you all of these things, right, each individual nugget that I tell you, as I as I said many, many times, I'm going to repeat myself, always think, and this will make you feel good if you're pro-Ukraine. I'm not trying to make you feel good, but I always think, what are Russia doing? Like, where are Russia getting this stuff? So every time an allied nation gives something to Russia, the question is, what are they or what, what's another nation giving to you? To give it to Ukraine. So what's another nation giving to Russia? Like, is, is this matched at all? 
And if it's not, like every one of these tabs I talk you through is, is a real bonus for, for Ukraine in, in terms of that relative um, asymmetry, I guess, between what Ukraine have and what they're being given and what Russia have and what they're being given. And of course, they are relying so heavily on having to manufacture stuff themselves, stuff themselves or get it from Iran or from North Korea and maybe some things a bit under the radar from from China, such as sort of helmets and body vests and Desert Cross 1000-3 golf carts and all those kind of things. But but the, the really high value, important stuff it is is coming from the West and it's coming continually. And every time it does come, think in terms of what are Russia getting. Now, of course, I'd say Starlink is is an issue that needs that that loophole needs to be closed. Uh, right, last two check Mi twenty four V Mi thirty five Hind helicopters um, uh, flew via Poland to Ukraine, so they've now fully been delivered, uh, where they will be handed over to the Ukrainian armed forces to join the fight against the occupied. It's good. They've lost a couple of these recently. In total, the Czech has sent eight of its Mi-24V, 35, uh, hind E's to Ukraine. The last remaining hind will be placed in a museum. Um, so there you go. Uh, thank you again to Czechia for that. Quote, Poland will contribute logistically as well as financially to the Czech-led plan to boost ammunition supplies to Ukraine via purchases outside of Europe, according to the Polish Foreign Minister um, on Thursday at Sikorsky again. This is super important, not just for the money towards buying the artillery ammunition. That's obviously super important, and it looks like they're getting plenty enough for that. But actually, the logistics is, is difficult, and one assumes that as soon as you buy something like this then it'll be in Ukraine in in a week just like when I buy something off Amazon but of course it takes an awful lot of logistical consideration to get equipment from all sorts of different places around the world some of this possibly we don't really know but South Africa may be involved India may be involved trying to get these shells from all these disparate parts of the globe and shipped to well, essentially to Europe first before it gets to Ukraine. Um, sorted out, I don't know if they have to give in, give them quality assurance and whatnot, who knows, but it has to, they have to get by either air freight or ships to Europe and then through to through European countries and eventually to Ukraine. It just takes a heck of a lot of time. And that's why, you know, it, it's, it, it's there's this delay between sorting this stuff out and then being... Uh, then being shot on the, on the battlefield by the Ukrainians. Uh, Le Monde is reporting, French outlet, that France suspects Russian hackers of carrying out cyber attacks, quote, in particular by ostensibly targeting public infrastructure or defence industrial base companies, such as Thales or the French land defence leader Nexter. This is a really significant uh, outcome to the, uh, to the Russians' war. I would suggest, against the West. And this is why I say we are at war with Russia, because there is very little functional difference between, as the Russians have done recently, cyber attacking a hospital to stop the hospital functioning properly, which leads to, what, deaths of people. There's very little difference between the cyber warfare doing that and a bomb doing that. It's functionally the same. Like a bomb stops a hospital working properly, so people die or whatever and cyber warfare stops a hospital working prob properly functioning properly so that people die you know that can, it's a, functionally the same as far as I can see it so when we are having our entities attacked by Russian cyber warfare then that is in my opinion uh, an attack it is a it's essentially the same as a military attack. It is war. It is cyber warfare. Now, what happens is that Russia will hide behind strategic ambiguity or, or uh, plausible deniability, sorry, is, is a better term there. Plausible deniability, which is, well, it was this shell organisation over there, but you can't tell it's us when it, you know full well it's, it's Russian agents. Now, the only reason I can think of that we wouldn't escalate well, two reasons. We don't want to escalate because we don't actually want to go to war with Russia or don't want to have to take the next step. 
Um, and and that, that that means that we will allow them a lot of leeway to do stuff like that because we don't want to take the next step. And the other thing to consider is that we're probably doing similar stuff back to Russia, possibly. Uh, and so, you know, if we say, right, that's war because you've done that to us, then Russia might be able to say, you've been doing that to us too. So I, I don't know where... The, where the reality lies with how much we're doing to Russia and how much they're doing to us. However, I would argue that this is effectively war. Experts are particularly concerned that there are trial balloons aimed at preparing major attacks, particularly during the European elections on 9th of June or the next Olympic Games when the eyes of the world will be on Paris. Um, Paris, so France is definitely a subject to a lot of Russian cyber activity at the moment. Uh, Paris and Berlin have reached an agreement that will allow the Franco-German company KNDS who produces, uh, that produces in particular tanks to create a branch in Ukraine, French Defence Minister Sebastien Lecornu reported after talks with German counterpart Boris Pistorius. That's really good news because there's been this talk about there is a growing chasm between France and Germany that they don't get on with each other and these are the two big players in the European, in the EU and in Europe you know, as a geographic area, these are the two big players, two massive allies, obviously, of Ukraine that have acted in different ways over the course of the war with Macron doing and saying what he said, um, being where he is now and Olaf Scholz doing and what he's done and saying what he said, but being in a very different place rhetorically to, I think, Macron at the moment, although Germany has provided more aid, actual military aid to Ukraine. Um, so it's really good news that they can work together uh, for, for Ukraine's benefit. Germany and France have reached a breakthrough on how to develop a planned next generation tank known as Main Ground Combat System, MGCS, and split up tasks between the two nations. And that's according to Reuters. So this is what we're talking about there. Uh, as well, I would have thought, not maybe not just about working together in Ukraine but working together more closely anyway for the next main battle tank. This is more than a milestone. It's a historic moment, according to Boris Pistorius. OK, first Ukrainian pilots to have undergone intensive training under the guidance of the Royal Air Force instructors have graduated from flight school, uh, is the quote here. Having worked closely with the French Air Force to align our training programmes, the pilots will now continue to France to con conduct advanced flight training before they progress to training on the F-16 aircraft itself. So I've been wondering for quite a long time exactly who's getting trained on what and how and where. And whether the the Ukrainians are picking up non-pilots and sending them to out to NATO countries to get training on how to be a pilot from scratch, you know, because if they take too many of their actual experienced pilots and they've got no one left to fly missions in Ukraine, they can't just take take those pilots. They have to be recruiting new pilots and putting them through training. What that problem that that may lead to is the fact that these are deeply inexperienced pilots. So they're getting very basic training uh, and then they'll get through, trained through on the F-16. But then, you know, is that, is it, will that be enough training to then say, right, well done, mate, you, you've done six months of training. Uh, we're going to just throw you into the skies against the Russians. Uh, good luck with the dogfight. So I, I don't know how it works, but there'll obviously be, I, I presume... You know, continuing to do training and flying maybe some of the safer missions and and I, I don't know how it works, but it, it's just interesting that, that the British here are, are training up what looks like newbie pilots, new recruits, and then the French are taking them on to do a more complex training. But neither France nor Britain use F-16s. And so that's your basic generic flight training before then moving on to the F-16s, either in Denmark or, or Romania or somewhere. A ten, so 10 pilots received basic training, ground school and language training in the UK, and the cohort will move on to more uh, to advanced flying training provided by the French Air Force. Um, okay, so uh, the Thales Group, again, this fr French manufacturer that actually works in, well, Belfast is one place. That's where the end laws get made. The, uh, um, the anti-tank guided missile, British equivalent, well, actually between the British and, and the Swedish, is it? So uh, I think it's Thalers and, and possibly working with, is it Saab as well? I don't know. Anyway, the factory in Belfast is working at full capacity to meet the demand for anti-tank and anti-aircraft missiles that the, the Brits are supplying to Ukraine. In 2022, Thalers Belfast products have been a key asset 
for British deliveries to Ukraine. I, I think that's probably meant to say since 2022. Star Street missiles are the anti-aircraft weapons built by Tireless UK in Belfast that are causing trouble in Ukraine, effective against Russian helicopters, fighter jets, and even drones. Weapons that Kiev is increasingly demanding. Uh, and uh, has also, they've also trained hundreds of Ukrainian soldiers there for the British Army. So they must get uh, actual you know, bespoke training for these systems. So Star Street there, the man pads, but you can have multiple ones on tripods, as you can see, or just one, I presume, launched, well, you can, on, on your shoulder, which is a man pad, man portable air defense system. But they also produce the uh, the end laws there as well, the anti-tank guided missile uh, systems. And we talk about lots of military equipment in, in many different ways. Uh, German aid to Ukraine has a really good thread that goes back months and months and months, where he talks about the different equipment that's been provided by that's been provided by Germany and then in use in Ukraine. So here's a German provided hydrant in service with 115 separate brigade, and here's a FIM 92 Stinger in service with a soldier. Uh, called Mavic from um, this particular unit. Germany delivered 500 of those relatively early. And then I just wanted to highlight this because it's nothing fancy, right? It, it is 100 metres. Uh, well, actually, no, what is it? It's, it's not 100 metres. Today, I have a special treat for you with friendly support of uh, some chap who provided me with these pictures. Here you can see a detonating cord of which Germany's delivered 100,000 metres to Ukraine since 2022. Spe unspectacular for most, but rarely seen. Just remember that there's an awful lot of equipment that is going to Ukraine that isn't your all singing, all dancing, fancy headline stuff like F-16s or main battle tanks. They need all sorts of stuff, including detonating a cord. Uh, so thanks to Germany for that. Now, Russians have been writing about uh, seeing, and this did a little bit of a... a went around the socials yesterday uh, there have been russian reports of ukrainian real swarms of drones and a swarm of drones some people call these mass drone attack swarms they're not swarms of drones are technically speaking uh, working as a single unit like a whole swarm with artificial intelligence or programming or whatever will work as a single kind of entity doing some kind of thing whatever it is the swarm would do um now, apparently, Russians have seen a swarm of drones in the Avdivka direction. The drones walked in an even formation along a straight trajectory. It says walked there. I don't know what that means. I guess flew. I presume these are aerial drones and not ground drones. Most likely, the enemy is testing a new technology, and this is not very good for us, says this Russian um, source. Of course, no idea about the provenance of that. I mean, several of these have been doing the rounds. So, you know, pinch of salt and all that, but it's something we have been expecting. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about swarming and autonomous drones and artificial intelligence uh, programming going on. Uh, it would be interesting to see how that manifests itself on the front lines. Now, RVC fighters or RBK, the, the, the volunteer battalion, the Russian volunteer battalion, three Russian fighters up on the northern border, They've been into Belgrade. They've captured 37 Russian soldiers, uh, said the Corps Commander Denis Nikitin. According to him, some of the prisoners want to join uh, the ranks of the RVC. They are currently being checked. If this option is not realised, all of them will be transferred to the exchange fund of the Ukrainian side. I, I mentioned this yesterday about how it must be so high risk getting capturing some Russians and a few of them saying, yeah, I'll sign up for you. I didn't really like what I was doing. Are you, the trust issue there, really? Are you not going to just turn your gun on us? Uh, how, how can you tell? It'd be, I think it would be pretty risky. But anyway, uh, they could be getting recruitments in that way. Uh, Russia's Defence Ministry, it's going on to sort of Russian stuff now, has published a video, as I showed you yesterday, from a factory in the Nizhny Novgorod region. The video shows Shoigu walking around the plant and checking the production of FUB uh, and 3,000 super heavy aerial bombs. These are massive. So yeah, nice one. Uh, so we had seen previously like 1,500s, uh, 500s, there we are, uh, 250s and whatnot. So you get these different size bombs. Uh, I just wanted to point out to you that these look super super scary because they are super scary but there are some claims that actually they won't be um quite so uh, useful i think john ridge said something about the the 
the airframes that release the smaller bombs will not be able to carry these 3,000 kilogram ones. They're just too heavy and and too big for the pylons and whatnot that you have to have. You know, essentially you've got you've got the plane uh, that's sitting on its landing gear. You whack that underneath the plane, and it, there's not enough height between you know the bottom of the landing gear and the, and, and the bottom of the plane f to have that. So otherwise. Or you put them on a wings, but the wings will not be able to sustain the weight of that unless you've got some massive bomber, right? And so things like the Su-24Ms or whatever it is that they use to, to drop the smaller bombs are simply not going to be able to take these. So then you have to put them on larger um, bombers, these strategic bombers that have been releasing the missiles like you saw last night. And the, the question is that if they don't have such glide, because obviously these are much heavier. Uh, and so they're not going to be able to glide as well as the lighter, smaller ones. So you're going to have to release them closer to the front line, which means you're going to be using a strategic bomber and dropping these like 20 kilometers from the front line. It's like, well, air defense is going to take out those strategic bombers. And then you can't use those to drop your cruise missiles and your ballistic missiles. So I, I, I'm not sure. This could be rose tinted glasses. This could be me trying to be too positive, but I, I'm, I doubt these are going to be as practically useful as people are are perhaps suggesting you know some people are worried about these quite a lot i don't know that they will be that worrying for the ukrainians but i could be wrong while certain western officials speak of freezing the conflict saying about the same video tendar here says the russian regime progresses in its bomb production even warheads with higher yields are prepared there's no debate in russia for peace uh, proving once more that this aggressive nation will only stop when being stopped, uh, the only part of peace is through Ukraine's victory, period. That's something I genuinely, generally agree with. Now, there have been some rumours going around at the moment. Uh, the, one of the big ones is, particularly because it's come from a news source, is that Russia will send 300,000 to surround Kharkiv and storm Ukraine's second city. Now the elections are over. Oh, that's Tim uh, White here saying that. The pretense can be cast off. Putin will press ahead with the new, mobili new mass mobilisation. The reliable Vorska quotes its sources inside the Kremlin uh, in order not to miss the oh sorry um in the near future they plan to recruit at least 300,000 people into the ranks of the Russian army all of them will have to go to fight with Ukraine four interlocutors in the presidential administration regional governments as well as high ranking official and ministry of defense told Verska about this at once so it, I, I was saying this morning that now that the election is over you are going to start seeing uh, moves towards mobilization and I, I think that that is likely to happen very soon and that obviously ramps up everything it escalates things so the Ukrainians is going to be thinking right what do we do about this the challenge for the Russians is that mobilizing 300,000 people yet yeah, sounds great uh, if you're just thinking about war and if everything else was fine in terms of equipment but you need to equip 300,000 people. Do the Russians have that equipment? Do they have the machine guns? Do they have the training capacity? Do they have the ammunition? Do they have the military vehicles? Do they have the tanks? Do they have the SPGs for all those people to operate? So 300,000 sounds good, but there's your challenge. Your second challenge is you're taking them out, like I say, with Ukraine. You're taking them out of the Russian economy, then suddenly, which has already got labor shortages. And that, that then has inflationary pressures because there are fewer people working in Russia. And so therefore, to, to attract people to your job, you have to offer higher prices and you go through the wage inflation spiral you know, which is famous in econ economics. So that is a real challenge. You then get inflationary pressures, things become more expensive, people don't buy as much and that that it all kind of spirals even further in, in a bad direction for the Russians. And those people are taken out of the economy where they were paying tax. So they were employed and then paying back tax to the government that then pays for the war, essentially. Now you're taking them out of paid employment and putting them into the paid employment of the state, which means that not only do they have to get buy more equipment to get these guys using that equipment, because that's the whole point of doing this, they also have to, they're not getting in tax revenue and they're also having to pay out in wages for these guys and then compensation for injury, compensation for death, families, um, all the other stuff that goes alongside employing uh, them in the armed forces. This 
just becomes this is why ukraine have been trying to put off mobilizing because of the costs of mobilizing are huge and then you have the added issue of morale inside the country um political discontent because mobilization is not popular and that's why putin waited till after the elections so he's like 88 percent right that gives me a mandate even though it's completely made up it gives me a mandate to do this people can complain all they like but uh i'm president uh, uh and I'm going to do what I like. But anyway, you will probably start to see this. And alongside that, you've got an, a now uh, Dmitry Peskov, I think, has just announced, well, not announced, but he's called it a war. He's clarified his terms and, and said it's, it's de facto war, de jure, it's a special military operation, which means legally speaking, as far as Russia is concerned, it's still an SMO, but it's de, a de facto war. So we're moving towards Russia much more formally admitting this is a big war and they need to mobilise and they will mobilise. So it's all these pieces of the jigsaw are coming together. Um, and uh, the Ukrainian commander at the same time says, I think this is Sersky, no, Pavlyuk, uh, saying Russia gathers 100,000 strong force, possibly for a summer offensive. Uh, Russia is creating a force of 100,000 soldiers, possibly to conduct a new offensive in early summer, according to the Ukraine's um, ground forces commander. The commander noted that the new force might also serve another purpose. Maybe the Russians will use them to replenish units that are losing their combat capability. Um, you add 300,000 to that and yeah, we, we, there's a, Ukraine will have a problem. So we'll see how both Ukraine and the West respond to these either rumours or eventualities. Anyway, that's a long one from me. There's, there's so much military news going on. There's so much happening at the moment. Um, but hopefully, you know, I'm your one-stop shop and you'll get all the information you need here. Hopefully it's not too biased um, and you are getting accurate stuff. That's really, I, I'm trying to give you accurate information whilst also saying, morally speaking, the Ukrainians, uh, I, am, I am, from my personal position a pro-Ukrainian. Anyway, that's enough from me. Take care. Speak soon.